Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Earth Journalism Network webinar. We're very pleased you can join us today for our discussions on policies to protect our planet. What are the priorities for the Biden administration? Uh, we're looking to see talk about what policies the new administration has already pro proposed or what actions they've been taking and whether this could change the tide for biodiversity protection internationally. Obviously a very important topic, especially in a year when we're expecting a big summit later this year in China on the Convention for Biological Diversity. Uh, we're very pleased that uh, to be joined today by some excellent guest speakers. We'll be hearing shortly from Jennifer Morgan, the Executive Director of Greenpeace International, from Anthony Swift, who's the Director of the Canada Project at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and from Stuart Patrick, who is the Director of International Institutions and Global Governance at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, we'll be hearing from them shortly. Just a quick introduction to the Earth Journalism Network for those not familiar with us. Uh, we are a project of Internews, the global media development organization. And we're also a community of over 13,000 journalists from more than 180 countries who are dedicated to improving coverage of the environment, climate change, and health. Um, this particular webinar series is a product of our Biodiversity Media Initiative, which is a three-year project to improve coverage of biodiversity and I certainly encourage you to go to our website at www.earthjournalism.net and check out all our projects, including the Biodiversity Media Initiative. If you are a working journalist and you haven't registered yet, you're more than welcome to sign up to be a member of our network. We have lots of opportunities and activities coming up. And in fact, just next week, we have two more webinars you might be interested in. Uh, another biodiversity webinar is taking place next Wednesday, February 24th, and that will be on the uh, topic of access and benefit sharing, one of the key discussion points under the Convention on Biological Diversity, so you don't want to miss that. And then on Friday, we have a webinar, especially for journalists from India, about renewable energy and what can be done and is being done to promote renewable energy development in India. So uh, you can find out all this information on our website and a lot more. So please do check it out. Um, and we, just before I turn it over to our speakers, uh, we definitely encourage you to submit questions. Uh, but please do so through the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. I know there's a chat feature as well. We, we don't tend to look there for questions. So Please don't put your questions there. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A feature. We'll go through them. And after the speakers talk, we will uh, pose those questions to, to them. Uh, we're expecting this webinar to last for at least 60 minutes. We might go over a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, I think it's now time to hear from them, from our speakers. So first up is Jennifer Morgan from Greenpeace International. Jennifer, would you like to take it away, please? Thanks so much. And um, thank you to the Earth Journalism Network for the invitation to be here and um, to share some of uh, Greenpeace's thinking on the climate crisis, but how we preserve biodiversity and protect people um, along the way. Um, obviously, um, I was keen to, to be here also because of the very important role that journalists play in covering the climate emergency and biodiversity. Um, I know that many of those here are probably on the front lines um, bearing witness to the mega fires that are happening, the hurricanes, floods, the droughts, species extinction that threaten the planet at increasing speed. And your work is very essential to um, solving the crisis. Um, obviously, we also have a pandemic um, due to humans pushing nature to its limits and cutting into precious forests, coming in contact with wildlife and deadly pathogens. And looking back at the past year, our, our planetary crisis couldn't be starker. So it's therefore essential for all of us to get the story right. Um, and I think, you know, much attention has been uh, focused, rightfully so, on ending the fossil fuel era and quickly transitioning to a green and just economy. And 
many, this is a crisis at Greenpeace, many of our campaigns are focused on empowering people to, to push governments to make the just transition to clean and renewable energy. But we also understand that um, although I think often overlooked, uh, the loss of biodiversity is a major crisis. Uh, scientists are calling this the age of the sixth mass extinction. And so biodiversity must therefore be addressed hand in hand with the climate. Um, because the strength of an interact web of life is really fundamental to adapting to our rapidly changing planet. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to look at kind of what the conversations are right now. Um, our analysis um, in 2020 showed that actually COVID-19 led to a spike in online conversations about human interdependence with nature and reconnecting with the outdoors. And data also suggests that the public understands this link uh, between the pandemic, climate change, and our biodiversity crisis. So, and that how our exploitation of natural areas puts us in more frequent contact uh, with wildlife and with pathogens, um, which increases, of course, the, the creation of conditions for diseases like uh, COVID-19 to emerge and spread. So as consumers kind of sensibilities are shifting to sustainable lifestyles or I think it's, it's fair to say that corporations have pivoted accordingly, some in, meaningfully, in meaningful ways, but actually many not. Um, and that's one thing I wanted to just draw to your attention and, and also in light of, of the transition in the US right now. I think many companies adopt language to suggest that they are pursuing sustainable practices when in fact, it's the same business as usual activities with a green veneer. Um, better often known as greenwashing, it's basically, let's face it, uh, hypocrisy. I mean, if you just look at airlines and oil companies, they love talking about carbon offsetting, but to be serious about tackling climate change uh, and biodiversity loss along with it, they need to stop carbon emissions from getting into the atmosphere in the first place and focus on how to do that. As just an example, and here's where the link starts to come in, you know, Shell last week published its uh, so-called net zero emission strategy, so-called because the oil major has set out uh, no requirement to cut absolute carbon em emissions, only emissions intensity targets, and there's no commitment to cut upstream production or a target for the production of renewable energy. Instead, there's this impossible uh, reliance on tree planting and Shell squarely puts the onus on customers to, and society to change behavior. Or Occidental Petroleum, another example, which issued an absurd statement earlier this month with its first shipment of quote, carbon neutral oil to India, or the recently announced by Mark Carney voluntary carbon offsets program. These are all examples uh, of that greenwashing. And I think um, all of what I've said in a way are symptoms of a failed system uh, where deep reform is urgently needed. Uh, COVID-19 has really shown how, how the time is now for a just and green recovery with biodiversity being central. And for that, we really need to change the current system as it's pushing us beyond the planetary boundaries. And by that, I mean actual extinction. And how to prevent it? Well, for a start, a fair way and a fair way to workers, ending industrial scale agriculture and the brutal commodification of nature, uh, the expansion of commercial agriculture together with tree plantations are by far the greatest drivers of deforestation. Uh, a decade ago, as many of you know, when nations established the biodiversity targets at the Convention on Biodiversity's uh, meeting in Japan, governments made these bold commitments to protect biodiversity and nature, but they failed because most nations still allow food commodity conglomerates, soya, palm oil, and cattle most notably, to shape policy and trade agreements. And so with the CBD happening later this year, we have just a crucial few months ahead to set a new direction. And the, norm, the enormous loss of species must be reversed and the perceived gap between nature and people closed. Uh, climate change, species loss and, and social injustices have to be tackled holistically and investigated, exposed and published by journalists like you. So governments and corporations are held to account you know that to stay within 1.5 degrees, uh, we need to increase the carbon uptake capacities of natural areas through protection and restoration. We need a reduction of emissions from agriculture, logging and other destructive forms of land use. And we need the elimination of burning fossil fuels for energy, energy and transport. And we have to do all three. We can't 
kind of count one against the other. We've lost so much time, we have to do all three together. But that's exactly, unfortunately, what, what many corporate and government stakeholders are trying to sell us, that we can continue with runaway uh, neoliberalism and capitalism or hyper-consumerism and somehow solve the biodiversity and climate crisis. So I'm here today to ask you, I guess, to challenge corporate greenwashing, where the, where the continued burning of fossil fuels is permitted and it's magically offset by hastily planting trees or protecting natural areas with disregard for rights for local communities. Destroying nature while doing the same thing is not an option. And so we have to be vigilant and call out greenwashing terms such as net zero, climate neutral or carbon neutral for what they are. And those are false solutions. And other false solutions like carbon capture and storage and voluntary carbon markets. Um, Radical transformation is really needed, um, where we move from fossil fuels to renewable energy as fast as possible. And bio, the burning of trees and other biomass for fuel also, it's not a solution. Um, over 500 leading scientists from around the globe said as much just uh, last week in a letter to heads of state. And so I think decision makers really need to listen, support, and respect, respect not only the scientists, but those who have lived in harmony with the land and the longest and uh, access to and the sustainable usage of lands by indigenous and local communities must therefore be integral to solving our planetary uh, crisis. So the moment's now actually to reckon with the failures of, of fortress uh, conservation, uh, which has evicted too many communities and really inflicted grave injustices without succeeding in protecting biodiversity. And I, I think often these community stories are not told or not covered by mainstream media. And so I, I challenge you and hope that you will tell these stories of systemic injustice um, experienced by indigenous and, and other marginalized communities. But you know, amidst all of this, we have hope. So we have the American people demanding uh, a green champion, Joe Biden, President Biden won the presidential election as the most ambitious and far reaching climate platform on any Presidential, U.S. presidential nominee for a major party in history. And he's already brought the U.S. back into the Paris Agreement, uh, but clearly has to go further. So our suggestions for him uh, with the biodiversity piece and the link to climate change in mind, um, which the public really needs your help in understanding, number one, a just transition to a fossil free, fuel free economy without the use of offsets or so-called nature-based solutions, un unlike Trump's cavalier approach of planting a trillion trees. Number two, addressing uh, publicly how our corporate food system contributes as much greenhouse gases to the climate crisis as emissions from transport. And number three, putting climate and systems transformation at the center of international development. All of these need to be Biden's uh, priorities. He has to lead by example to restore faith in US leadership. And for you, we, we just ask you to make explaining these very complex issues a priority and challenge any false narratives that delay this necessary green and just transition. So, you know, in, in final, final sentences, we just have to simultaneously address the interconnected crises of climate, biodiversity, inequality, and injustice. We can't improve upon some while making others worse. And we can't let corporations and private interests dictate the agenda anymore. We need governments to put people and the planet first, not profit. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for keeping to time. And now we're going to turn over to Anthony, Anthony Swift from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Take it away. Thanks Anthony. so much, James. Um, I'm going to be speaking in a little more detail uh, on a specific uh, Biden administration commitment that uh, uh, covers some some of the ground that, that Jennifer laid out more broadly. Uh, but that is the United States' commitment to uh, 30 by 30. And specifically, I'd like to talk, uh, talk about what the Biden administration's uh, 30 by 30 commitment means for its broader nature and climate agenda, as well as the important role that indigenous conservation uh, is likely to play and needs to play in its implementation. Uh, but just a word given, a, a word to, uh, uh, the importance of 30 by 30, which I, Jennifer laid out fairly well in her presentation, which is that we are facing a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. You know, the intergovernmental science-based policy on biodiversity and ecosystems recently released a report showing that uh, over a million species globally are threatened with extinction, with 
half of that number uh, likely to become extinct in coming decades unless habitat is both protected and restored. And the conversion of, of those natural places uh, are primarily happening for agriculture development and resource extraction. Uh, the United States' 30 by 30 commitment creates an opportunity for additional leadership in a space that has already uh, seen you know, a strong, ambitious coalition of, of nations um, agree to commit to protecting 30% of their ecosystems as part of uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity and create some really specific regional opportunities in the Americas uh, to protect biodiversity. And those, of course, you know, are gonna be most relevant for Canada and Mexico as uh, the U.S. works with its neighbors to identify ways to uh, align conservation um, commitments to protect broader conservation corridors and uh, identify ways, particularly, this is particularly relevant for Canada and the United States, where migratory uh, routes can be protected as part of a, a North America strategy. But one of the things that I want to spend, without going into some of the very specific cross-border corridors that you know we, we can speak about if, if there's interest, but one of the specific things that is very important about the way the Biden administration has framed its 30 by 30 commitment is that it released this, uh, this commitment in an executive order as part of its climate agenda. And it also, uh, you know, uh, included 30 by 30 in um, its campaign agenda as part of its, its uh, strategy to address climate change. And the reason for that is, is because, uh, you know, I think the Biden administration recognizes the critical role that natural eco intact ecosystems can and must play in, in both mitigating and adapting to climate change. And this was a role that was really laid out uh, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2018, that we are now at a place where not only do we have to rapidly transition to clean energy as quickly as possible, but in order to eliminate or reduce the likelihood of some of the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, uh, we're going to need to harness the and protect the capacity of our natural ecosystems to uh, sequester and store carbon. You know, our natural ecosystems can provide one third of the needed climate change mitigation capacities to maintain a 1.5 degree uh, trajectory if at the same time we are uh, transitioning our, our energy systems. I do wanna have a word on how nature-based, how our ecosystems, uh, or just to support what Jennifer said that, you know, natural solutions focused on preventing carbon uh, emissions from forest and, and other you know, carbon rich ecosystems and enhancing their abilities to sequester carbon simply can't be an alternative to shifting away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible uh, for a variety of reasons. One, the math simply does not work. It does not remotely work. And, and two, you know, the reality is this, the more rapidly we transition our energy systems from fossil fuels, the more effective natural climate solutions will be because we are limiting, we are preserving the, you know, we're, we're limiting the speed at which climate change will stress the ecosystems that we're hoping can help pull carbon out of the atmosphere. One area that I do want to focus uh, or provide a little bit of more detail on is, is forests. You know, the reality is forests already uh, sequester a third of human caused uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and forests are also, uh, you know, some forests are particularly powerful carbon sinks. Uh, and one, one point that I think has been lost in the discussion on the role of forests has been the role that, you know, northern forests play in both or can play in, in being part of the, the climate solutions. Uh, you know, the boreal forests of Russia, Canada, and, and the United States um, actually store more carbon acre for acre than, uh, than any other forest ecosystem in the world. And, uh, uh, you know, Canada's boreal forest is the largest intact forest in the world. It, it stores nearly twice as much carbon as the world's global oil 
supplies combined. And why that's important is that, you know, these forests are being lost at a rapid rate. The intact portions of these forests are, are being rapidly degraded by industrial activities, logging uh, and fossil fuel development. Keeping the carbon in these forests where they are is going to be critical. And I think that's why, you know, the Biden administration, in addition to committing to 30 by 30, also laid out a uh, commitment to work with uh, the United States' neighbors to create a framework to better monitor and account for carbon emissions occurring in forests and agriculture so that they can be reduced. And I think that with an eye to 30 by 30, 30 by 30 creates an opportunity for the U.S. to ensure uh, uh, efforts to conserve natural areas have a climate lens that ensure we're not just create, we're not just protecting spaces, but we are actually taking some of the most carbon rich places off of the uh, uh, the table and ensuring that uh, you know the global the international community does a better job than it has been doing in accounting for the significant emissions that are occurring in degraded forest areas. And this is particularly a, a problem in in the north where uh, forest conversion is occurring mainly because of logging activities and not you know, uh, uh, because of a conversion from forest to agriculture as, as is happening in Brazil. The, the current um, regime for assessing the climate impacts of, of forest conversion don't, um, don't account for uh, forest degradation to the degree that, uh, that they do for deforestation when it's for agricultural purposes. And of course, the other priority that uh, the Biden administration really highlights in its 30 by 30 commitment, and it, it, as well as in other areas that it has been uh, moving, it has been uh, elevating this issue is the importance of, you know, centering our efforts to protect, um, you know, natural places with indigenous uh, voices and indigenous knowledge and really, you know, moving to a indigenous led conservation framework. Uh, you know, in both the United States and Canada, indigenous communities have been leading uh, the effort to create novel and innovative ways to protect uh, natural ecosystems for decades. Uh, they've been all too commonly sidelined in uh, decision-making that occurs on their traditional territory. And I think that, you know, the U.S. commitment to center indigenous-led conservation in its approach is, is something that is going to make, you know, I, I think it'll be an opportunity for both the U.S. to learn and to, to advance some of these, uh, these efforts, you know, some of the efforts that have been particularly, uh, uh, effective in Canada have been, you know, the, the Indigenous Guardians program, which, you know, provides support for Indigenous peoples to care for their lands uh, using traditional knowledge and science. Uh, and of course, you know, the Indigenous-led conservation model of, of conservation uh, decision-making, which, you know, also considers the question of what conservation looks like and, and where um, conservation needs to occur based on both, you know, scientific and in indigenous knowledge. So, you know, I, I think there'll be more to discuss, but in terms of what next, I think that, you know, moving forward, there's going to be a lot of work to do. Uh, the reality is the U.S.'s 30 by 30 commitment sets a, you know, sets a, a, a marker, but the process to determine what that is actually going to do on the ground is going to require um, engagement by, you know, myriad of federal agencies, state agencies, and indigenous communities and international partners. So I think that we are now at a place where the work begins and that work is going to, you know, require uh, an effort to ensure that 30 by 30 means, you know, a level of protection that protects indigenous values in the land, the climate value of the land, biodiversity, and also that we're picking the places that, that are most important for those three values to protect. Great, Th thank you, Anthony. Um, and thanks again for keeping the time. Before I turn it over to Stuart, uh, both Jennifer and Anthony have mentioned the importance of indigenous communities and their role in conservation. And I would like to just remind our viewers that uh, the Earth Journalism Network currently has a story grant call out there, an opportunity for indigenous journalists to apply for funds to 
do their own environmental stories for their local media outlets. Uh, if you're an indigenous journalist and you have a good story idea, but you need a little money for travel or whatever, uh, check out the EJN website at www.earthjournalism.net. Look under opportunities and you actually can see several story grant calls there, uh, opportunities for journalists to apply for funds on different topics, including the ocean and renewable energy and this opportunity for indigenous journalists in particular. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Stuart now, please Stuart. Thank you so much, James. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Jennifer, to meet Jennifer and Anthony, um, who are uh, two great experts uh, in this field. Um, I'm an expert, uh, to, to the degree that, I'm, that I am an expert, uh, it's an international cooperation, but I've been spending some time on international environmental cooperation recently. And um, so my uh, remarks will be mostly about the international agenda, including two major initiatives uh, that the Biden administration should exercise leadership on. Uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging um, the sea change in U.S. policy that we're seeing after, um, you know, four years of catastrophic U.S. disengagement under outgoing um, uh, under under President uh, Donald Trump, um, Joe Biden has promised to restore uh, not only to restore U.S. climate leadership but also to accelerate the decarbonization of the U.S. and global economies. And I think that for somebody who's a foreign policy specialist, Biden's determination to quote put climate change on the agenda in the situation room um, and mainstream these concerns across cabinet departments is really welcome. Um, and I think it's a, it's a major change um, in, in what has been a very siloed um, and fragmented approach to um, climate change and also and environmental cooperation generally. Um, and I think Joe Biden's appointment of John Kerry as his special envoy signals of the seriousness of his determination to fight global warming uh, and to put it at the a center of U.S. foreign and national security policy, um, but I, but it's all also clear that um, uh, the U.S. global environmental policy can't be limited to climate change um, because the uh, the planet's climate emergency, the, excuse me, ecological emergency, is not limited to global warming, and biodiversity protection me needs to be elevated. Um, as we've heard, the world is experiencing dramatic declines in species and ecosystems that's jeopardizing the countless services that the natural world provides to us and that we all often take for granted. And, you know, these services range from the oxygen we breathe to the clean water we drink, to the insects that pollinate our crops, to the microorganisms that enrich our soils, and to the pharmaceuticals that we obtain from organisms. Um, also include um, coral reefs that sustain healthy fisheries and so much more. And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored this connection between biodiversity and human health by pointing out the, uh, the role that environmental degradation um, and illicit uh, animal trade uh, pose uh, for us, the risks that they pose in terms of increasing zoonotic diseases. Um, the administration, for, for somebody who's a foreign policy specialist, the, the designation of the climate emergency as a tier one national security threat to the United States um, is a huge shift in US foreign policy. And it, I think it represents what I've called the age of ecological realism. And that's the dawning recognition that traditional conceptions of US national interests and national security need to be expanded beyond traditional notions of geopolitical competition and material interest to include basically um, a concern with the fate of the biosphere upon which all life and of course human prosperity and well being ultimately depend. And that is just simply a huge transformation. Um, it's a recognition that we live in the dawn of the Anthropocene, right? The age of humans, uh, a new geological era in which humans have become the most powerful force shaping the earth system. And that requires a, a, a tremendous reorientation of conventional approaches uh, to US and international uh, security. Uh, and let me assure you that the US foreign policy establishment is only beginning to come to terms uh, with this reorientation and, and what the implications of this worldview, because it really is, I think, uh, uh, it will be looked back on as a major transformation in the way that we see foreign policy. Um, now, the scale of biodiversity loss is staggering. Uh, as um, my colleagues pointed out, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has uh, documented just a, a, a tremendous um, decline uh, in, in nature, really. Um, populations of wild vertebrates, for instance, declining by 60% since 1970. 
uh, the oceans ha already having lost half of their shallow water corals um, and extinction rates that are basically a thousand times uh, higher than their background rate. But what's really interesting to me is the degree to which the, the cost of humanity's assault on the planet, um, which is astronomical, has uh, begun to penetrate even some of the, uh, notwithstanding the greenwashing that Jennifer talked about, has begun to penetrate uh, sort of the inner sanctum of, uh, of global capitalism. Um, you know, last January, about a year ago, the World Economic Forum, uh, da the folks in Davos, uh, which is no bastion of socialism, as we know, published, published a startling report underscoring just how much uh, the international economy depends on biodiversity. And then and the capital assets that are provided by nature natural capital, if you will, according to its calculations, something like $44 trillion of economic value generation that is more than half of the global domestic product is it moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services and is therefore exposed to nature loss. Um, the World Economic Forum called biodiversity loss a quote an existential threat to humanity. And I think that that is quite remarkable. And it's also interesting to note that climate change is a factor in biodiversity loss, but it is not the leading factor, uh, which is intensive land use, which has reduced, damaged, fragmented, and eliminated ecosystems and habitats crucial to species survival. Other ones, of course, include unsustainable exploitation, invasive species and pollution, and obviously climate change over time will become most important. So Joe Biden though has a gold, golden opportunity, I believe, to show the world uh, to, slow, to slow these trends and to change um, the, the current disastrous trajectory. And two priorities stand out. The first is achieving a successful outcome of the pivotal 15th Conference of Parties to the UN Convention on Biodiversity, which is scheduled to take place in Kunming, China from May 17th to May 31st. And the second is ensuring a successful conclusion to the UN High Seas Biodiversity Convention, which is entering its fourth and ostensibly final negotiating session. Now, the vast majority of media attention has focused on the next meeting of the UNFCCC, which is, of course, scheduled in Glasgow at the end of the year. But I think uh, for you journalists, it would be wonderful to spend more time looking at Kunming because the decisions taken there could frame the actions of governments for decades. As we know, they tend to lock in a lot of government policy. Now at that event, which was postponed like the, um, the Glasgow COP because of COVID-19, the nations are slated to adopt a new strategic plan which proponents are building, billing as a new deal for nature and people. And last month, at the One Planet Summit hosted by French President Emmanuel Macron, more than 50 nations calling themselves the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People committed themselves to supporting the, so the so-called 30 by 30 objective that Anthony discussed, basically to per permanently protect 30% of Earth's land and marine surface. And the coalition emphasized not only the, the need to protect, prevent biodiversity loss, but also to pres preserve carbon sinks, uh, produce economic benefits and prevent future pandemics. And even though the United States is not a member of the, con uh, not a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the only country besides the Vatican that is not a party, and it's unlikely to become one soon given um, the hurdles to Senate ratification, um, there's no question that the U.S. attitude will have an important, significant influence over negotiations, even as an observer. One of the big things that ha needs to happen at Kunming besides having countries endorse this 30 by 30 commitment is to try to come up with some more specific um, and um, verifiable targets on the part of individual countries. You know, uh, as Jennifer pointed out, the, in, uh, in 2010, um, the parties to the CBD endorsed the so-called Aichi targets which called on states to do things like slow the uh, destruction of habitats, reduce overfishing, et cetera, and otherwise uh, adopt biodiversity friendly policies. But the vast majority of these targets were uh, overly vague. They weren't linked to specific commitments. They weren't reviewable. Um, and as a result, there's been a failure and a sort of a lost decade over the past, um, uh, over the past 10 years. So, the next few months are going to be critical to turning things around. Um, and um, I think that uh, 
you know, the struggle for biodiversity protection is, is probably amenable to um, the albeit imperfect Paris Agreement approach, uh, which is coming up with, you have universal goals, but you have individual um, ways that countries say that they're gonna get there, but they have to be verifiable and they have to be subject to some sort of a universal periodic review. Um, so I, that's, that's something that needs to happen in the coming year. The second major initiative, and I'll, I'll make this quick, is, um, is to, to basically uh, have a, a prompt conclusion to a UN High Seas Biodiversity Convention. Um, you know, that's the most important treaty that I think most people have never heard of. Um, it, it covers basically 43% of the planet's surface and the water below. Um, and it basically would fill a gaping hole in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which has no real rules to govern the exploitation and sustainable use of living marine resources and ecosystems on the high seas, which is basically that portion of the ocean that lies beyond national jurisdiction and basically includes about 90%, given its depth, about 90% of the world's ocean habitats. Um, now, the United States, again, is not likely to um, ratify such a treaty in the short term, uh, but it has been involved in the negotiation process and it's likely that as with UNCLOS, the United States would eventually accept it um, as customary international law. And so the United States has, a, has an a idea here to, uh, has a role here to be really decisive. Um, the open seas are a poorly governed um, wild west um, uh, arena uh, covered, governed by an incomplete patchwork of bodies. Uh, and this is a tragedy um, if to, and, and also a threat to the life on earth because these are the, the high seas are, which are sort of used to be seen as sort of open and barren are basically a repository of extraordinary biodiversity. Um, but success is gonna require overcoming divergent influence of, multi, excuse me, interests of multiple constituencies, including major fishing nations, uh, a block of developing countries called the G77, small island nations, and um, and a major, major advanced market economies. Um, the four issues, uh, which I'll be very brief on, that are uh, at stake here are introducing uh, marine protected areas, which only cover about 1% or less than 1% of the open ocean right now. Sharing benefits of marine genetic resources, which is a very controversial issue, particularly amongst wealthy countries that tend to want to have lock up the patents for uh, genetic resources to themselves, rather than sharing them for the benefit of all mankind, which is a principle in the treaty. Another is mandating environmental impact assessments, which some uh, in the private sector try to resist. And then finally, there's the question of capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. These are all issues that are going to have to be dealt with over the next several months. Um, but the Biden administration has a major chance uh, to lead here in an area that are really the quintessential global commons. Um, but the, these two issues uh, going forward, the future of the Kunming um, uh, COP and um, the Treaty on High Seas Biodiversity are enormously important ones uh, that uh, the United States has a chance to lead on. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Stuart, for that. And yes, I'm so glad you mentioned, especially the, 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 the treaty talks on the high seas. That is something that gets almost no attention in the press. I know we at EGN, we've been very eager to draw more attention to it. And so for those journalists out there interested to learn more, uh, the treaty is sometimes known by the acronym BBNJ for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions. Uh, so check that out. And uh, again, I mentioned we have an open story grant call for ocean stories and stories about this treaty would certainly be interesting. So we're going to open it up to questions now. We got a bunch of questions. Um, and I'm going to begin uh, with one from Mike Shanahan, who notes that during his presidential campaign, President Biden said the U.S. should mobilize $20 billion dollars to stop the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and impose, quote, significant economic consequences if deforestation continued. Now, what actions do you think, and I can address this to all the panelists, but let's keep the answers brief because we do have more questions coming in. Um, what action do you think the president should pursue and has anything happened on this front yet? And before I, I, I turn it over to you, just a reminder to our audience, please, you're welcome to add more questions 
talking to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, anyone want to tackle this uh, question first about the Amazon rainforest and what the US government can do about it? Yes, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. I think, um, I think the answer, though, is not about money. I think paying the uh, Bolsonaro government or organizing funding uh, for a government that is uh, basically not following any laws, uh, removing the rights of indigenous peoples, threatening environmental organizations that are working in the Amazon, um, could only uh, embolden him. I think alternatively what the Biden administration needs to be doing is uh, working to um, get those national policies in place where possible using the levers uh, that the US has in a very serious way because uh, it's clear the Bolsonaro government uh, does not uh, take climate change seriously at all. It's going in the opposite direction. So whether that be, you know, as I was talking about rethinking even the entire trade relationship, um, you know, um, engaging the multinational uh, large agricultural companies that are US based in what they're doing in Brazil, um, looking at supply chains, um, I think, and deforestation included in supply chains. Uh, those are the debates that are happening in Europe right now. Uh, those are the types of things I would advise the Biden administration to look at. Thank you, Jennifer, anyone else? Yeah, just uh, briefly, uh, this this issue was a huge one that um, it's been it's been on the table for a while, and um, there was a, obviously a, about a year and a half ago a, a, a huge uh, controversy between President Macron of France and uh, 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 President Bolsonaro, um, where um, which which really raised a question of of um, you know whether or not Brazil is in a sense the owner of the Amazon um, or, or its portion of the Amazon rainforest, or is in fact the custodian mm -hmm. of the rainforest for all of humanity, given the importance. I mean, the, the phrase the, the Earth's lungs is a little bit overused, but obviously a huge uh, proportion of uh, carbon sequestration um, occurs um, within the Amazon rainforest. Alas, a declining amount given the deforestation and the drying of of, of the Amazon rainforest. I, I tend to agree that. Um, that uh, the Biden administration should definitely uh, use a number of carrots and sticks um, to try to get um, the Bolsonaro regime to um, to, um, to 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 begin to, to to take things more seriously and linking looking for uh, different ways of linking um, trade. I think is a, a very important step in that direction. That also applies to uh, to climate, where I think that a lot of people are looking to the World Trade Organization to have um, climate waivers, for instance. Uh, excuse me, um, the border adjustment, um, carbon border adjustment taxes um, that allow uh, countries that are actually taking things more seriously um, to be able to penalize those countries that are in a sense free riding on the efforts of say the European Union. Um, and, uh, and I think that a similar approach could be used with respect to protection of biodiversity. And I would just quickly agree with, with both of those comments and also say that, you know, Biden laid out a desire to look at the climate impacts of our supply chains as well. And I suspect Brazil was on his mind in, in that commitment uh, because you know, many of this, much of the kind of the, the market drive uh, that is leading to you know, deportation in Brazil is, you know, it is a trade link to US markets. Uh, but the other, the other thing that I did want to flag is that you know, in addition to those measures, which I agree are, are critical. It's it's also important that you know uh, the U.S. and countries that are interested in pressuring Brazil are taking equivalent measures to protect their own intact forests, which all too often isn't the case. And just as an example of that, you know Canada is right behind Brazil in terms of intact forest loss globally. So it's it, there will be a need for for northern countries that want to Brazil to uh, do necessary uh, action in, in the Amazon to ensure that they're taking action domestically as well. That's an interesting point. I mean, if we're going to go that route with Brazil, I just wonder if that means does the U.S. and other, uh, other governments, do they need to follow similar policies with countries like Indonesia, uh, which is also you know, undergoing rapid deforestation, maybe someday with DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, their, their forest is not under as much threat at the moment, but could be someday, even Canada for that matter, you know, I mean, th this kind of 
opening up uh, this question of uh, responsibility over the, uh, you know, the forest as a kind of global resource that, you know, that does raise questions about our policies in general. Um, would you agree? I, yeah. I, Go ahead. yeah, I would just say quick, I, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, even the way the international rules in evaluating uh, for deforestation, and forest degradation are set up, you know, in some ways give Northern countries a past in that, uh, you know, converting a, you know, an intact forest to, you know, a soybean field or a ranch is considered deforestation. But, uh, you know, some clear cutting activities that uh, lead to de facto deforestation are not considered such because there is not a, you know, another use that uh, that force is being used for. So it's that those are rules that in many ways uh, support the kind of forestry that, that happens in, in northern countries and allows them to avoid both the biodiversity and climate consequences of the activities that they permit. Yeah, maybe just quickly, I think the other thing, the fact that that's an example in all of those countries, James, is about the commodification of nature. It's about the fact that you have people in those countries, and I think mostly elites and corporates who are benefiting from taking the resources out of those countries and exporting them, right? And so I, actually that's what I was talking about a little bit about needing a, a different a development model for those countries that actually allows people on the ground to benefit from those resources. A, a rethinking about our whole food and fast, you know, fast consumer societies in northern countries, as far as a relocalization were possible. That doesn't mean no trade at all, but it means really rethinking the entire thing, and having a way of um, if we start talking about international agreements, looking at the whole hierarchy of norms, in which you would actually have the environmental agreements uh, have as high. Uh, a status as, as um, say, the, the WTO or trade and short-term mm -hmm. economic growth. And I think that's the debate for 2021 mm -hmm. that uh, it really needs to come to the fore. Yeah, if I could jump in, I, I, I also I agree. And I, I think that, you know, uh, approaches you mentioned in the news, but approaches of, of the U.S., of the U.S. has for foreign aid and also its posture within, um, you know, multilateral development banks and other things are very important. You know, the United States has something called the Millennium Challenge Account, which is a... Uh, which is a criteria-based um, um, uh, U.S. aid um, uh, access um, for foreign assistance uh, program, and some of the criteria for for access to the Millennium Challenge account um, resources could be could could be modified to um, to talk about you know the, the need for countries that are going to be recipients to actually develop a biodiversity conservation plan, for instance. And there's been a lot of talk about the need to mobilize go from uh, billions to trillions in terms of advancing the sustainable development goals. But, you know, the sustainable development goals are, are have a lot of tensions in between them, right, in terms of economic development and traditional economic development versus biodiversity uh, protections and climate change uh, action. And those probably need to be retweaked in terms of, uh, excuse me, need to be re reconfigured in terms of their implications for for the volume and types of foreign assistance that are being offered, so that they they privilege biodiversity protection as well as climate change mitigation, uh, as opposed to some of the other goals um, that might work at cross purposes with uh, with um, sort of responsible uh, approaches to nature. Thank you. Uh, so, just by way of background, there have been discussions over the years on international treaties about forest management. Uh, they've always Foundered, uh, including uh, there was treaty talks two years ago under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. They've always foundered because of issues of over global I mean, national sovereignty, but I guess there's a chance it could be raised again. And I'm glad, Stuart, you brought up the question of international finance. We have a, a question for Jennifer Morgan from Joy D. Gupta, although I think anyone could respond to this. When do you expect the Biden administration to pay? the funds that the U.S. has committed to the Green Climate Fund and, and how much, do we have any indication of how much they're gonna, they're gonna pay? Great question, I think, and I think really fundamental. There's a lot of focus on the emissions reductions and that type of thing in the U.S., which is incredibly important, but this finance question is, is fundamental. So I think the first thing that they need to do is pay up their arrears, right? What did they not pay uh, during the time uh, of the Trump administration. And 
I need to check um, as far as that goes, as far as exactly how much that is. But I think that plus um, uh, looking forward, because the current debate, which will be at the G7, I think this year, is about looking beyond 2020. Countries were developed countries were supposed to deliver 100 billion by 2020, and there's been a recent report by the Secretary General commissioned by him that uh, that has not occurred. And so now the question is how to pay for that and how to move forward in the post 2020 finance, which of course we're already in. <laughs> and so I expect that to be a, an issue at the Petersburg Dialogue that will come up hosted by Chancellor Merkel in May. I expect it to be at the G7 summit um, hosted by the UK on that. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, and, and when? Well, it should be in the budget requests that are going in right now. Um, so, and how much I can uh, pull out my file in my brain and try and get my old numbers out of my head and come back to you on that one, Joey, to Jadeep. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so uh, just uh, I mentioned to all the journalists out there, you know, there's a lot of going to be a lot of opportunities this year to raise these international environmental issues. So we, Jennifer mentioned the G7 summit in May. The U.S. is also holding a climate leadership summit in April on Earth Day, April 22nd. These are all great opportunities for you journalists out there to be, you know, pr producing stories on these topics. And of course, later in the year, we'll have the the biodiversity and the uh, climate summits as well. It's going to be 2020 was supposed to be a big year for the for the environment. And a lot of that has been pushed now to 2021. So lots of opportunities for good reporting on this. Um, I have a kind of I want to switch gears a little bit as our panelists, you know, uh, kind of on a more practical level, this 30 by 30 commitment, you know, it's obviously an important one. And I know the Biden administration has uh, committed to it in my state of California, our state government has committed to it and has promised to set aside 30% of its land for conservation by the year 2030. But I think there's a question here, how exactly we're going to do that, because there's not a lot of land available, you know, to just turn uh, from from use into conservation. There's uh, a lot of the land here is already, it's either private land or it's uh, you know, owned by the federal government, or or there's obviously land that's in military bases that has been mentioned as one possibility for conversion. Uh, there's, uh, but I mean, I think this issue I'd like to ask you is well, governments who are committed to this, how are they going to go about it when there's such a demand for for land from so many different uses? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Softball question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I certainly don't have the, the full answer uh, in, in the U.S. context, but I think that, you know, it, it's going, I think it's, it's, it's going to require an approach that is going to be multifaceted. So, you know, one, one and, and, and at the, you know, at the top of the approach is sort of the critical question of what, the, what counts as protected uh, and, uh, um, but, you know, one, and it's going to require some investment. I think that, you know, the reality is this is where, uh, 30 by 30 is a, um, is a, uh, climate strategy really comes in because, you know, by and large, uh, we, you know, both protecting intact ecosystems and in some cases, uh, you know, um, Re, you know, rehabilitating e in, uh, ecosystems can be one of many uh, effective measures to get carbon out of the atmosphere as quickly as possible and keep carbon, you know, out of the atmosphere. Uh, and that is going to require some. I think in the U.S. context, that's going to require some investment and a combination of, you know, one thing we'd like to see and, and that, that I mentioned is that. In addition to investing in uh, in efforts that you know protect and, and enhance carbon sequestration, um, both in public and potentially private lands, uh, you know, there's also in the U.S. the political opportunity for this, uh, you know, isn't clear in the short term. But you know, there is going to be a need to to, to you know account for the costs uh, of 
um, you know, industrial activities that are threatening these areas as well. So, you know, part of it is sort of a carrot of, you know, investing in, in, in activities that do put places off of, you know, create an alternative uh, model for protection and also really count, you know, really start to cost out in industry on some of the externalities of, of, of the activities that are converting these ecosystems. Mm. Uh, can, I, can I say that, um, I mean, what's interesting, I, I, my impression is that it will be easier, but I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. My impression is that it will be easier for the United States um, to meet the target with respect to its marine areas, uh, because mm. my understanding is that somewhat, something like 26% of uh, US um, coastal and EEZ um, waters are basically enjoy some form of uh, protection uh, and whereas only about 12% of US land does now. Uh, again, I think there are a, a lot of uh, potential for um, increasing um, the area, the land area that's under some form of protection. But again, as sort of Anthony began to suggest, you know, how highly protected are they really? You know, what counts as protected? Um, are these areas important or kind of marginal from the perspective of biodiversity? Uh, and you know, how, how do private um, landowners uh, take part in this uh, if they wish to? And to what degree is there some sort of a certification mechanism to sort of you know, uh, verify that they're, they're actually conserving this? And so it should be able to fall under this particular umbrella in the sort of you know, conservation easement <laughs> type um, type uh, scenario. My only quick addition is just to echo what, what Stuart had said earlier, which this points to the need for implementation plans, right? I mean, um, and I think that that's one of the big lessons from Aichi and from before when these targets were set, um, is that, you know, you do need to move to a different uh, way of doing this. And I agree that the, the Paris approach is not uh, the optimal one, but at least you do have a monitoring, a binding monitoring uh, reporting and uh, review system and verification system, and you do have a ratchet mechanism to scale things up, and you do have to put forward your nationally determined contribution. So I think that's often something that gets overlooked. We are huge on 30 by 30, don't get me wrong, um, but both for the seas and for land. Um, one of the un untold stories, I think, often is the machinery that's needed behind it in order mm -hmm. for these agreements to actually get implemented and make a difference. Right, and those, those uh, practical actions on the ground are often carried out by state and local authorities, not even the national authorities. Uh, I know we're coming close to time. I did have one more question for you uh, about the Migratory Bird Treaty. Uh, this was something, again, that I think a lot of journalists don't know about. It's not often brought up. It's one of the earliest environmental treaties ever ever signed, I believe is over a hundred years ago, if I'm correct, it was uh, brought into force. But, um, you know, it came, it came to everyone's attention because the Trump administration uh, loosened some regulations under it. And I assume the Biden administration is going to tighten those up again as part of its effort to, to roll back all the all the, the, the regulations that the Trump administration loosened. But do any of you, Anthony, you may have mentioned this treaty. Do any of you want to talk a bit more about that, why it's important and why journalists should cover it? Yes, well, I'd be happy to, to start. Um, you know, on, on the, just to, well, I, I do understand the Biden administration has that in the, you know, in the hopper on the many things it's working on to undo from the Trump administration rollback. But the Migratory Bird Treaty is, you know, it's a treaty that recognizes the fact that, you know, uh, in North America, you know, many of the bird species don't see the borders and they don't adhere to them. So, you know, we often call uh, Canada's boreal forest the, the bird nursery of uh, North America because every year about a bir billion birds, you know, migrate there to, uh, you know, to, you know, to hatch and uh, three to five billion birds come down to, you know, the United States, Mexico, and, and even as far as South America. So these bird populations require, uh, you know, require havens and habitat up and down the continent. And the Migratory Bird tre Treaty is a way to, you know, is one mechanism to ensure that we're not just knocking the, you know, uh, 
uh, critical tables or critical, you know, weight bearing areas out for, uh, for these species. And I, I would also say that, you know, it, it's been an effective treaty, but it, 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 there is more opportunity with 30 by 30 to protect these migratory uh, species. And, you know, again, I mentioned the boreal, but, you know, there was a recent study that showed that, you know, uh, bird populations in North America have declined by 30% over the last 30 years. And, you know, boreal populations have declined by, you know, 40 to 50%. Uh, and it is because of habitat lo loss, you know, up and down those migratory uh, pathways and, you know, in particular in the boreal. If I could pick up on uh, Anthony's uh, comment, my my I, my uh, 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 eighteen year old son would um, would uh, slay me. Uh, he's a birder himself, an avid birder. If I didn't um, uh, weigh in on this, I mean, when Anthony said uh, a decline of thirty percent, I mean that just to put that in numbers, three billion billion birds have vanished from North America over the past five decades, and so this is a remarkable uh, decline and a dramatic one. And uh, there are a lot of people out there who care about birds in terms of citizen yep. involvement. And they are, they're, they're some of the most avid citizen scientists collecting data, contributing to eBird and many, many other things. And um, so the Migratory Bird Treaty is, is a hugely important uh, instrument uh, that needs to be um, revived under President Biden. Thank you. So we are past the hour mark, so we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I want to thank our panelists again, but I do, I do have one more question for you and a request. We have a request from our audience that any resources that you may have mentioned, every re any references, if you could please share them with EGN after the webinar, and we will pass them on to all those who have registered. Uh, also, a reminder to all our audience, this webinar will be uh, a recording of it will be put on YouTube and on the EGN website, so you can view it later or share it more widely. Uh, but final question for each of you, just briefly, if you could uh, each state what you think are some key stories related to international biodiversity or more locally, since journalists often do cover, uh, you know, cover stories more locally, but perhaps related to international issues. What are the key stories that you think journalists should be on the lookout for, especially this, this year, but also into the future uh, in such a big year for the environment. Do any of you have any final thoughts on that? I can have a go. I have a few that I'm thinking about. Oh, let's see if my internet holds up here. Um, I think um, the linked with the oceans issue is the industrial exploitation of oceans. I think it is um, just kind of what, what, what we were saying as far as people not being aware of how unprotected that, that whole space is. Another is really the, the destructive corporate livestock farming. And um, um, I think there needs to be much more told about the um, unsustainable and unhealthy levels of meat and dairy consumption. Uh, because that really links in to, and you can do that locally, you can do that um, on, you know, the, the industrial part of things, but, and the link of that with the biodiversity loss and the actors who are in the, in the, in those stories. Um, I think there's a need for investigative journalism in many of those areas. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, just a quick note on that is we know that these intensive livestock operations and poultry farming, they also have big implications for the spreading of diseases, pen, epidemics, uh, pathogens, and that, that, I don't think that has really received a lot of attention, at least in my, in my impression so far. Um, and at all, there, there's a related issue of the use of antibiotics in these operations and how that is spreading uh, resistance uh, to antibiotics, which is also a big threat to public health. So lots of issues there to tackle. Uh, Anthony or Stuart? Anthony? I, I can jump in uh, okay. quickly. And I would say that, you know, one, that there are going to be many stories this year. Yeah. I think it's going to be a big year. I think there is likely to be, I mean, there's a growing sense that we need to uh, take action to protect our remaining global intact forests. And I think that a, a global, there's been pressure on in specific areas in you know, Indonesia, in, uh, in, in the Amazon. But I think that, you know, more broadly, there, we don't have 
many intact forests left. The old growth forest of British Columbia are, I think it's 1% of, of the forest in, in uh, the temperate rainforest of British Columbia are left uh, intact. You know, the, the boreal is one of the big global ecosystems that has, you know, a, a significant percentage intact. But I think that the, the, the you know, a, a global effort to uh, protect intact forests are, is one area to, 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 that I think there will be more stories uh, at the role that indigenous people who live in those traditional territories are playing in, in rallying for that call. And, uh, you know, the, how that fits in with 30 by 30 commitments and climate commitments and uh, our efforts to, you know, stop biodiversity collapse is, you know, all fits in. Thank you, Anthony. Stuart? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, there's a few. Um, one of them, I think, is um, the degree to which the private sector has or has not um, taken on board the notion of natural capital and, and the importance of preserving biodiversity. Um, there's a lot, a lot of uh, headlines about um, the Blackstone Group, the world's largest private equity um, uh, or, or uh, equity investor, um, uh, basically saying that from now on, it's going to look at um, some of the um, sustainability um, concerns when it comes to um, the corporations that it's investing in a lot of skepticism about that uh, that as well but I think that that's an important thing to look at another is um, it didn't get a lot of attention but um, and it's a much smaller actor in the development space than say the World Bank but the UN human development report is quite extraordinary that came out at the end of last year the most recent one which basically says how do we how do we uh, transform development and particularly the concept of sustainable development to the advent of the age of humans, basically. And it's really uh, quite remarkable um, in terms of uh, the intellectual ground that it, it, it breaks. And I, so I would uh, commend that report, which really talks about the importance of indigenous knowledge. It talks about how um, the inequities in terms of globally about who's taking it on the chin when it comes to climate change and, uh, and biodiversity loss around the world um, and, uh, and, and just um, how unsustainable the current path that we're on and we, we need to value nature uh, in terms of our development decisions. Um, I also think that there are probably interesting stories about the extraordinary richness of the open oceans. Um, we, you know, the cliche is we know more about the moon than we yeah. do about the deep ocean. And I think that's beginning to change. Uh, quite a bit with uh, the advent of um, new forms of technology and uh, and sort of remote sensing um, and uh, and the advent of big data and so I think that's a really interesting thing and then finally um, this question just to get back to the issue of um, sort of uh, the pandemic and um, and it's linked to biodiversity um, some so there's probably a, lot, a rich vein of articles to be uh, to be mined uh, in the concept of one health just the connection between uh, the health of biodiversity. Um, uh, well, health of nature, uh, the health of humans, and then the health of wild species that inhabit um, uh, the ecosystems around us. Wonderful. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you to all our panelists. It's been a really interesting discussion. We really appreciate your contributions. And uh, please do send those references or you know, any, any resources you want us to share with the audience. Please do send them. Thank you also to our audience uh, for your attention and for your questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, but they're, they're great. We love interacting with you. So keep in mind, again, our webinars next week on access and benefit sharing under the Biodiversity Convention and also renewable energy in India. And please stay, stay in touch with us and check out the EGN website again. Thank you all. Have a great day and a great year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.